Now, if I was to tell you what the daily and the annual costs are for putting up these young men, well, 91% young men, that cross the English Channel in those dinghies, people would say, oh, he's just making it up, isn't he? So rather than me telling you, let's ask Dr Mike Jones, Executive Director of Migration Watch. Mike, how much is it now costing us on a daily basis to accommodate people in hotels, private apartments and all the different methods that we use? It's astonishing. It's eight million a day. Eight million? Yes, this has increased from six million. Um, it's increased by a third since Rishi Sunak has come into, into office. The cost of the asylum system per annum is, you know, close to four billion now and close rising. To four billion yeah. pounds a year. And, and this is just the asylum system. You know, that's without considering the costs of mass legal economic migration on housing and infrastructure. So this is just the tip of the iceberg, but it imposes a huge burden on the British taxpayer. Yeah, do we talk enough about how much, how much this costs? Or do you think generally there's a kind of a reluctance to talk about this? Or will Labour start to use this maybe as a political weapon? Uh, we, we do talk about the costs, but it, it does tend to be focused more on the asylum system. I, I think we should look more at the immigration system as a whole. But obviously this is a very visual phenomenon. Yeah. You have yeah. you know, people in dinghies coming over. Yeah. They're being housed in hotels, subsidised at the expense of the British taxpayer. And you know, w we have a, a cost of living crisis, a housing crisis. We have young people who can't get onto the property ladder. People paying half their income to live in mouldy well, shoe boxes. So we had a young guy, young guy called George. I don't know what he was, 19, 20 perhaps, on a live show we did with a live audience last Thursday up in Essex. And he said, look, I'm a young person. I have to scrimp and scrape and fight for everything. Yeah. Um, and, of course, housing, a huge cost for young people. Mm. He said, and, you know, I just see an unfairness in people crossing the channel and being put up like this. It is a very live political issue. And... Professor Matthew Goodwin keeps polling this and keeps saying Westminster often doesn't want to debate this, but the public does. Mm. Is there any end in sight to this from a UK perspective? I mean, ultimately, it comes down to the Supreme Court decision. Uh, the only game... In which, which will be when? Uh, close to Christmas time. And that is going to tell the government whether they can proceed with deportations to Rwanda? Essentially, yes. Both political parties are united in what needs to be done you need to destroy the people traffickers business model. The Labour Party want some sort of exchange program with the EU, which is very counterproductive. Both the Conservative and Labour Party want to attack the supply chains. But ultimately, you need to make it economically irrational for people to enter this country, and you need to attack the demand side. And as we saw with Australia, uh, and the similar scheme that they had with Papua New Guinea and, and Nauru, yeah. you need to detain you need to deport uh, people who come here through irregular means. I don't think either party really have... I mean, even if Rwanda was to be proved legal, we're only talking about a few hundred people, aren't we? Well, it, it does depend on a number. You need to deport a critical mass of people for the scheme to actually work, because it needs to be a disincentive. You know, if, if you're talking about small numbers, then it's not going to work. I always, it was unclear to me how many Rwanda would take. Was it 200? Was it 2,000? It definitely wasn't 20,000. Mm. That I do know. And, you know, we have to look to what the, the extraordinary, and if ever you use the word invasion, everyone goes mad. But, I mean, what can you call 200 boats? What can you call double the population of the island arriving in Lampedusa over the course of the last weekend? I mean, presumably... If double the numbers thus far have come into Italy that came in for the whole of last year, mm. some of those people finish up in Calais, Dunkirk, etc., don't they? Yes, and it, it's not just Lampedusa. There are various uh, gateways into Europe, uh, around Greece, um, the Spanish islands, even the Balkans. Uh, but, you know, ultimately the EU has tried to kick this into the long grass. Uh, they need to scale up Frontex. They need to protect their borders. They need a critical mass of boats there. Uh, to patrol their waterways. But that only works if you stop the boats from coming in. Yes. Some evidence, I, that, I mean, some evidence that the Greeks have done pushback mm. and have said, no, you're not coming in. Uh, I didn't see much appetite from Ursula von der Leyen to actually do this. It would seem this is becoming, across Europe, perhaps the most divisive political issue of the lot. It is. The, the ironic thing, the EU actually has a bilateral deal with Tunisia which includes a returns <laughs> policy, so why aren't they enacting it? But, but it is very divisive because the EU has to make a decision. 
Is it a, a globalist organisation that wants to benefit humanity as a whole, or is it a sort of continentalist supranational group that tries to benefit European citizens? And there are huge divisions there. Yeah, I saw the former president of Germany saying, hey, kind of, we've got to put a number on this, enough's enough. We've got Hungary, Poland saying no more. We've even got the Swedish Democrats in coalition government in Sweden saying no more. Um, it, it looks as though the South could be completely swamped. Yes, uh, and it could potentially tear the European Union apart. Uh, I, I can't imagine the Hungarians or the Poles or even the French are very, are very happy about the situation. And, uh, you know, it's an existential crisis for the EU, essentially. And they've got to make their mind up. Do they police their external borders yeah. or do they absorb these people? And yeah. Well, I warned them, uh, Mike, I warned them back in 2015 that if you allowed people just to set foot on soil, having crossed the Mediterranean, if, if they could stay, I said many millions would come. And last night on this programme, I was challenged. I was speaking to an Italian journalist when I said, well, if we go down this route, many millions more were come. And she said, well, Nigel, not millions. Well, I did some homework today on this. Since that speech I gave in the European Parliament, 4.7 million people have claimed asylum somewhere in the European Union, and it'll be 4.7 million more unless something is done. Mike, final thought, heading up to our general election. It's not that far away. Mm. Um, can we see clearly that this would be a big issue? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the Conservative Party are hoping that the election becomes a referendum on the Rwanda plan. And I, I think the Labour Party have made a rod for their own back on this because yeah. if, if it does work, if the deterrence effect does actually take place, Keir, Keir Starmer has the option either to stick with his policy or backtrack. And it was his first big policy announcement. And it yeah. seemed within 72 hours he was having to contradict himself as to whether we'd be part of the EU quota scheme for people coming into Lampedusa. Didn't go well for him, did it? No, it didn't, because the, the Labour Party promised us a returns policy, you know, a bilateral yeah. agreement. Yeah. But this isn't a returns policy. It's an exchange programme. It's like the Erasmus scheme, but for illegal economic migrants. And, you know, it's just going to increase the pull factor. Yeah, how ironic that the Conservatives, having failed so completely thus far on the channel, mm. could find it to be a, an election, perhaps not, maybe not winning, mm. but an election advantage uh, issue.